okay, now suppose Alice wants to talk to Bob. You know, maybe it's like a remote login or <coughs> something like that. But you want to somehow communicate with Bob. So she just issues the command as she ordinarily would. Okay, so she says, I want to talk to Bob. And the computer then, behind the scenes, goes to the KDC and says, hey, I want to talk to Bob, and makes this special request. We'll look at more of that in a second. And the KDC, of course, replies. Okay, what's in those? Uh, the request includes the TGT, right? That's your credentials. And somehow we have to authenticate, right? In the sense of making sure it's not a replay or something like that, right? What's the simplest way to authenticate? Just encrypt a timestamp, okay? And so that's what we do. Now, again, it's using timestamps. So the benefit of timestamps is? Efficiency. Efficiency. Fewer messages. Only two there, okay? Can't get much better than that. Uh, but the downside is? Time is a security critical thing. Okay, we have to worry about the clock. Someone could actually attack your implementation of Kerberos by attacking your clock and making it impossible to communicate. Uh, okay, so what's in the request? Okay, so the request includes an authenticator. Uh, the KDC can check that, make sure it's current within the acceptable clock skew. Uh, the reply comes back and it says, okay, Bob. Why does it tell you Bob? Don't you know you're trying to talk to Bob here? Well, the point is you might have several things going on at once, right? Okay, and this is the one you're trying to talk to Bob. Okay, and this is key, K-A-B. It's telling you this is the session key that you and Bob will use to talk to each other, okay? Then it gives you this ticket to Bob, meaning it's a ticket, right? You go and present it to Bob, and then Bob will talk to you, right? That's the idea. Uh, it's all encrypted with S sub A. What's S sub A? It's a session key that Alice knows, Alice's computer knows, and who else knows? KDC. How does a KDC know? I thought it was stateless. It's in the TGT, right? Okay, so when it decrypts the TGT, it says it's Alice, and it says here's the session key I should use when I create this other stuff to send to her. Okay. Uh, what about the ticket to Bob? Well, a ticket to Bob looks like this. It says, hey, you should be talking to Alice. Here's a key that you can use to talk to Alice. And it's all encrypted with this key, which is known to Bob and, and who else? KDC, which created that. Okay. So you got it here. When Alice receives this, she decrypts this. She gets the ticket out. She keeps track of the key she's going to use to talk to Bob. Now when she actually wants to talk to Bob, she hasn't done that yet. Okay. Now she actually wants to talk to Bob. The computer goes to Bob and presents the ticket along with an authenticator. What do you suppose this authenticator is? Just the same as before. Encrypted timestamp. I mean, what could be simpler? And then Bob has to authenticate himself, so he's got to take the timestamp and encrypt it with the key KB. Okay, now just a reminder what was in the ticket here. The ticket said you should be talking to Alice, right? Here's the key you should use to communicate with Alice, which you already did, okay? Uh, and it's encrypted with this key that Bob knows. All right. Mutual authentication, two messages, right? Okay. And we've got a session key. Pretty slick, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, um, uh, what do we want to say? Oh, timestamps. Okay, this is just saying, you know, that timestamps have their pluses and minuses, right? So the plus being two messages, right? So here we go. Two messages, mutual authentication really efficient in that sense. Uh, but we have to worry about the clock, okay? So that's an issue here. Okay, here's some things to think about. Excuse me. Okay, so when Alice logs in, you can read that, the KTC sends this back to Alice. It encrypts the session key S sub A and encrypts the TGT all with the key K sub A. That's fine, because Alice can decrypt it, get the important information out. But the question is, Look at the TGT. It's this guy, right? Okay, now it's encrypted, right? And it's encrypted with a key that's only known to the KDC. Nobody else knows that. Anybody else knows that? The whole thing's broken already, so give up, right? So the question is, why do you take this thing that's already encrypted and encrypt it again with the key K sub A? Now, obviously, you need to encrypt S sub A, right? But why would you encrypt the TGT when you send it to Alice? Yeah. 
That's true. Alice is the only one who should have it, but think about what happened in the very next step. You want to talk to, you want to, talk to Bob? What's the first thing you do? You send your TGT without any encryption or any protection whatsoever to the KBC. At that point, anybody can grab it, right? So what's the point? I don't know. I'm glad you're stumped because I'm stumped too. Okay, so uh, this is sort of one thing you see people criticize, right? It's sort of extra work for no extra security. Right? So you've encrypted the bits. That's some extra work, but it's a minor, you know, minor issue. Now here's another question. Uh, so when we do this login to Bob, let's go back there. Yeah, so at this point here, uh, when Alice wants to talk to Bob. Alice is anonymous, right? If Trudy's watching these messages, she doesn't know it's Alice or Bob. She just sees a ticket go past, which is encrypted. She can't read. She sees a encrypted timestamp and another encrypted timestamp. Okay, so how is it that Alice can remain anonymous here? I thought when we used a symmetric keys, it was really hard to be anonymous, right? So why does that work here? That's right, because Bob knows which key to use. There's only one key. He doesn't have to know who he's talking to. He always uses K sub B. Now, similarly, you can look at, let's go back here, right here, and this says, I want to talk to Bob. It doesn't say Alice wants to talk to Bob. So that implies you're anonymous. How can Alice remain anonymous here? TGT, okay, because of the TGT. It doesn't matter whose TGT the KDC gets, it always uses the key, same key to decrypt, right? So it doesn't have to know who it's talking to. So it's almost like you get the benefits of public key cryptography, the easy sort of um, anonymity, almost for free. Okay. Oh, okay, here's a, here's a good question, too. Okay, so why is this ticket to Bob sent to Alice? In other words, Alice says, hey, I want to talk to Bob. What does the KDC do? It creates a ticket to Bob, sends it to Alice. Now, what does Alice do with that? Sends it to Bob. Sends it to Bob. That's two messages, right? What, why couldn't the KDC just send it directly to Bob? That's one message. Obviously, the people who designed Kerberos were worried about efficiency because they use timestamps, right? So why not reduce a message and just send that directly to Bob? Is, that, is there a about that negotiation? Uh, no negotiation, just send it to Bob, right? It's Bob's problem. It's not my problem. Um, <laughs> that's a thought. That's a good thought. Uh, but you still have to do the authentication, right? The authenticator is really what convinces you that it's Alice talking to you at that point. And you have the key KAB that you got out of the ticket. So, so here's the alternative. So the KDC sends it directly to Bob. Uh, Bob decrypts it, and then what? And then he waits. He waits for what? <coughs> he waits for Alice to contact him, right? What does that mean? What does Bob have to do while, while he's wait, waiting? He has to remember something. He has to keep state, okay? In other words, if Kerberos is, you know, two things, efficiency and stateless. Here, stateless wins, okay? In other words, Bob doesn't have to remember anything the way it goes, right? Because Alice doesn't send it to him until she's ready to talk to Bob. So remove some threat of a denial of service kind of thing, okay? So it's a little less efficient, but uh, helps with the stateless, stateless part. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, forget that. Um, okay, in Kerberos, um, the key case of A is just the hash of Alice's password, okay? So that's the way it's generated. Now, that's fine, that works, uh, but an alternative that's actually used uh, some places and some other uh, uh, things is you could do this. 
Suppose uh, instead the key K sub A is just generated at random and it's shared between Alice and the you know, KDC. So now they have this key K sub A. Now how do I protect the key K sub A on Alice's computer? Okay, here's what you could do. You could use Alice's password, hash that to get a key, and use that to encrypt the actual key that Alice and KDC share. Okay, now what happens if you're using this approach? What happens when Alice logs in? She still just types in her password, and then behind the scenes, the password gets hashed, and then that key is used to decrypt the actual key, and now you're good to go. So it's like one extra step, and it's a minor, insignificant amount of additional work. But, you know, it's something. Okay. So is there any benefit, any possible benefit to doing it this way as opposed to this way? When? If you change the password. Uh, when don't you have to change it? You don't ever have to change it. When you right? change the password. When you change, when you the, change password, the password. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So if you change your password in this case, what do you do? You could just decrypt this with the old password key and re encrypt it with the new password key, and you don't have to tell the KDC anything changed, right? On the other hand, up here, if you change your password, you have to tell the KDC and securely exchange this key, which is a critical step, right? Really important to get that uh, exchange. So there's a potential uh, advantage in this, uh, in this case. All right, everybody see that? If you don't now, you will when you do the homework. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so that is used um, lots of places, just not in uh, 